Hey, this is Duya. For this week episode, I invited Mash Trish, who create Bamama Cooks. Uh, Mash Trish, thank you so much for joining with us today. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you please introduce about yourself briefly? Okay. Uh, I'm Trish, uh, founder of Bamama Cooks, and also Bamama Shop now. We're very uh, simple of using food as a medium to create social change and um, make some impact for um, a lot of displaced people. And our main goal is to hire them mm. and make uh, a business out of it. Yeah. Wow, that's really impressive. I know you, uh, you walk at a Michelin restaurant. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. So like, <laughs> so how did you? Very shy. Like, how did you became like? Mm. I mean, how did you interested in the cooking? Mm. That's a crazy. I don't have any like fancy story, but it's basically I dropped out of college mm -hmm. and I was studying marketing and I was very unhappy. And then my parents were very mad, and I have to make them very happy and proud as an Asian parent. So I was like, okay, <laughs> let's try culinary, <laughs> and that seems like the fastest way. To get the degree back then, so I joined the um, uh, a French school, and then later on, yeah, I got really hooked into it because um, I thought that was like something that I really like. Discipline is what I really needed in my life, and then yeah, I was very lucky that I got a job um, at a place called Upstairs McKella. And then they were recruiting, and then yeah, I went for Stotch, and they started hire. So I, I basically started as like a kami, but then they put me as a dishwasher for like two months just yeah. to break my spirit. And then like you know, you climb up the ladders later on too. And then I became a sous chef. Um, so that was about like how many years ago was that? Like three or four, five years ago. Yeah. Wow. And I worked there for almost four years. Mm. Yeah, there are like a few like women who is mm. a culinary chef in, in Myanmar. Okay. So like, uh, did you face any difficulties like in that culinary field? Uh, yes, yes. Um, it's it's. I actually went back to Yangon mm -hmm. to work at this restaurant, which I will not name, <laughs> and it was horrible. Because back in my days, sh uh, being a chef is not a profession that's mm. looked at as like, uh, oh my god, like you're so cool thing, right? Like, and so a lot of women were not like practicing the the this artistry like mm. a profession or professionally. So it was very difficult for me to really understand my own people <laughs> and working with my own female colleagues and try to understand like um, culinary wise was not that great to be honest. Um, but in when I got into Bangkok too, um, kitchen is a very hostile place. So, and I hate that like very manly, toxic, masculine mm. culture in there. And that the fact that you have to kind of like fight for your life or once when I became a sous chef, um, I had to break the spirits of like the newcomers so that they would, you know, be more disciplined and a lot of shit like that. that and that really put a drain on you because like that's not my character. Mm -hmm. But then I have to train myself and develop like new personalities to become this like mean, evil bitch. But... It's, it shouldn't be like that. <laughs> like, I'm, I have my own, like, business now, and, like, it's been working without me yelling at other people, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you were in Yangon, did you decide to, like, open a restaurant? Uh, so I went back to Yangon, like, twice. So oh. the first time I went there, I worked at this fancy place. 
and it didn't work out, so I came back to Bangkok, and then uh, I went back in 2019. Mm. That's when I quit that Michelin place. I just went back because I was burned out. I was very depressed. I was very mm. like burned out, and I went. I didn't know what I was doing, so I opened up um, a fermentation kind of like in a research kitchen yeah. about uh, Burmese fermentation. And later on, it becomes a brand called Pofaments, and then mm. I started producing like fermented stuff. Yeah, mm. but that is now closed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, no more. <laughs> when the coup happened, mm. were you in Yangon? Yeah, I was. I was right in it. It was <laughs> okay. my first time experiencing in my in in my in my generation. Yeah, and um, it was wild because I've only heard stories of my parents' yeah. times, right? Talking about their eighty eight generation and how it happened, and it seems very like surreal to wake up to like my mom crying. Like I can still remember her like crying, yeah. um, and it was so silent. There's no like phone lines, nothing, and I think. I didn't have the time to like process it because like my work was still going. I've got like th four, three staffs to pay. And the only thing in my mind is like, where are my girls? Mm -hmm. And then because my workplace is really close by. So I went there, I check up on them and they went partying the previous night. And I was like, oh my God, fuck <laughs> these girls. Like I literally went out and looked for them. Mm -hmm. um, because there were no phone lines, I could not like even call them. And immediately, that was like February 1st, so it was payday. And I had like, no, like, like 5,000 jot on my hand, mm -hmm. and everything was in the bank. And every ATM, I like, I couldn't withdraw. I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. you guys went through the same thing. But I was like, I have to pay my staff, I have to pay my staff. And yeah, I got really lucky two days later, my friend hooked me up. She, she worked at the bank and she's like, okay, you just, you know, withdraw how many. Mm -hmm. So I withdrew all the money that I have, which is not that much. Yeah. Um, yes, and we lift off that. <laughs> Did you also per participate in the protest in Yango? At first, when they started, no, but later, yeah. of course, it leaned into that. But I wanted to support in a way that, like how I can really provide something that would impact them yeah. <clears throat> and I figured that my kitchen was like I decided not to open my kitchen anymore because I don't know what kind of customers that I yeah. will be feeding and I just turned my kitchen into a, a, a place to make like um, food donation place so I cook mm. up like a lot of like simple food like lepato or like tomato like things like that and then we we made about like 5,000 meals um, in total and that was split between my other friend so her she has her own big kitchen restaurant and then yeah we we just randomly crowdfunded it yeah. and then posted it on Instagram and be like yo we're gonna be doing this so can you wow. guys just donate money and then we run like yeah for until until like a month no a month and a half I did that and then it got a little bit risky because in the st street that I was living in they know my they recognize my face yeah. so yeah one of them like told me like oh just stop doing this donation thing yeah. like they know your face now yeah yeah that was really cool I might I might have your food like somewhere you might so when did you decide to leave the country when yeah um 5th of april but prior to that i think a month mm -hmm. before that my friend called me up and she said like yo like i'm leaving do you want to and i it was an easy decision for me because yeah. at that time already they were shooting at protesters yeah. i was involved in like like other fundraiser stuff so it could put my parents in danger yeah. Yeah, I think like the only reason, yeah, I moved here was to protect like my family. Mm. Did you guys stop at the at the airport or something? No, it was fine. I don't think I was like that, like doing 
like my name wasn't mm -hmm. I don't think it yeah, wasn't yeah. on the list yeah I was pretty safe and then like I left at like pretty early flight that zoo flight um and yeah basically half of, I knew like half of the people on the flight yeah. and then they were carrying like a bunch of animals um Yes, it was it was really weird. Like even the immigration officer was confused yeah. to see my passport and he's like, "Wait, you have a visa to Thailand?" and I was just like, "Uh, yeah." <laughs> now you arrive in Thailand like mm. what kind of activity you're doing right now? Now, um so uh, I'm based in Chiang Mai now. Um I'm full-time focused on growing bamama. So I don't want Bamama to be just a brand for food, but it's a community building space. Mm, yeah. So even the space that we have now, it's a multifunctional space. So sometimes it's a chef's table, sometimes it's a workshop space that anyone yeah. can come and rent and do whatever that they want. Um, yeah, so uh, and aside from that, I also do involved in catering food to people, the organization, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And if they want to do like fundraising, you know, fundraiser stuff event, then yeah, mainly very involved <laughs> with yeah. fundraising stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how did you get the idea of like Bamama Cooks? Bamama Cooks, damn. Um, okay, this is, <laughs> I, I will not go in depth, of <laughs> like how the name came about because it's really wild but the when I was living in Bangkok um, I was very depressed because I was alone and mm -hmm. finally I moved away from the community safe hub that I was living in and I had a phone and I was just like okay let's just record like these cooking recipes mm -hmm. and it was a way for me to kind of like heal I was unemployed, I was broke as fuck, and like, yeah, and then it kind of like took off. Somehow people started like, I think I was mostly like angry most of the time, <laughs> and I started making these food contents in a way to like heal myself pretty much. And then from there it grew, and it is that uh, Bangkok is like a very depressing place for me mm -hmm. still, so I moved to Chiang Mai with like the intention of like, I'm gonna rent a house, a big space and then have like built a multifunctional community building stuff so yeah. Mm. yeah so like like what kind of food like you can like it, it, you will offer to the people like here um it depends on the type of event so when we're having a chill chill party and mm. inviting like a lot of um my friends in like I would mainly cook simple like mohenga or mm -hmm. onokoswe or shakoswe a very simple food um but our chef's table is a little of like it's it's becoming not my baby <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah it's like Burmese reimagined food I call it but it's a lot of people think it's like authentic Burmese but it's not authentic it's whatever the fuck I want to eat yeah. and <laughs> I just cook it and like when i feeling feeling like nostalgic missing home then yeah. i would put it in the menu like this this chef's table there would be shan don't mm -hmm. because i was missing dad a little bit and i'm half shan so wow. so things like that and i mainly talk about like food storytelling and about the politics and what's happening in myanmar during the dinners and yeah it's like all like mainly promoting yeah. um ethnic food for me, uh, it's not just one like bama food, you know. Yes. Yeah, there's so many different kinds of food. Mm, that that's a really cool idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, I still haven't learned like all of them yet, so like mm. I'm not an expert. I'm still learning, researching. Do you want to go back to Myanmar, like to open uh, your own restaurant, like mm. in Myanmar, if there, the coup ended? Hmm. <laughs> I think I, I had a chat with my friend about this. If the coup ended, I'm gonna go back and like do absolutely nothing. Mm. I would just like live on a farm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if there's electricity. I'll just be like, fuck all. Like yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll become a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think I will have a restaurant. I do want a restaurant here. Mm. I think representing your culture and yeah. bringing that kind of 
um, yeah, my pride is very important mm -hmm. and doing it the right way too so that like not just only white people eat my food like <laughs> Burmese people actually actually yeah. eat my fruit so I like that <laughs> so uh, what do you hope for the future of Myanmar <laughs> that that's a really big question I know. <laughs> that's a big question I think oh man fuck <laughs> I think we, we man what do we hope for Myanmar I, I really hope for some peace, definitely. I think we do deserve that. Yeah. Um, I, th I, th I really wish that when the war ended and that we can rebuild everything else, then mm, yeah. I hope that we can build a city that everyone's like, oh my God, this is a model country in Asia that yeah. everyone like looks at it. It's like, you know, very PC, very queer friendly, very like, you know, like legit, like proper, like government set up. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, and a leader that we can, or no leader, which is fine, mm -hmm. <laughs> but every ethnic tribes, everyone living in harmony. I think yeah. that's a really good future for MR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, like, would you like anything to add? Um, Come eat it, but mama. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs>